Most people stare up into space with wonder. Yet we have this almost alien world on our own planet just teeming with life. It's a world completely out of sight and out of mind. I have the utmost respect for corals. They're really sophisticated animals. Coral is a fundamental part of a huge ecosystem. They continue living as long as their environment allows them to. There's this big heat wave that's traveling around all over the world. The coral bleaches, and what you're seeing is its skeleton underneath. It's like your body temperature changing. That's the seriousness of the issue. So we're sending two teams to put cameras down and capture this bleaching event. The wind and the storms is really the controlling factor right now. The wind just took us. The stern anchor didn't hold. It's just demolished. You're working in an environment every single day that humans were built for. Your body is caught up, and then you open your eyes. And it's dead as far as you can see. We don't have any time to waste if we want to have any hope. We live at a unique moment in time where we can change history. It's not too late for coral reefs. This has got to wake up the world. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on the film. Thank you. It's, uh, it's awesome being here. Wonderful film, an incredible accomplishment. It's an accomplishment, though, I think we can say we wish you didn't have to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of a, a, a sequel in many ways to your last film, Chasing Nice. Talk to me about how you found the story of, of Coral and, and what made you want yeah. to pursue it. Um, Richard here reached out to us. He saw the film and uh, was a big scuba diver and was doing a big project on coral reefs. And he told us what was happening. And we started talking and we saw what was happening in the oceans and that we had some way to visualize some of the changes happening there. And that's what we wanted to capture. You visualize it. I mean, you can visualize it because it was happening so fast. That's the crazy thing. Like some of these changes. Uh, so our last project, we were documenting glaciers changing. And those cameras have been out there in some cases now for 10 years. And they're still documenting the changes happening to glaciers on, a, on an annual basis. We um, just had a, a glacier And there was just a huge, huge week, iceberg right? that broke off of the Larsen Sea ice shelf. Um, what we saw with these corals were that the, these places were changing in a matter of months or weeks. Um, this is not a, a multi-year documentation that's necessary anymore for, for the changes that are happening right now. Talk to the audience about, uh, or I guess, Richard, why don't, why don't you just talk to the, or Zach, actually, you could as well, uh, uh, about what exactly coral is and why it's important. I think this one might actually be best for Zach. There you go. Uh, corals are incredibly kind of complicated yet simple organisms. So th they are animals, right? But extremely simple animals. Um, yet they have a plant inside of their tissue, and that's actually how they feed. Um, so it would actually be as if we had algae living in our skin. We were green, and instead of eating lunch and breakfast, we all went out and sunbathed for six hours, and that was how we got our meal. Um, and so with corals, those plants actually can't cope with the heat. And so under a scenario when it gets too hot, it would be like us going out and sunbathing. But instead of it feeding us, it's actually eating us up from the inside. Um, so that's the issue with bleaching is they are simple. Um, and just the smallest change in their environment actually can cause catastrophic change in, in, in that ecosystem. And the, yeah, the interesting sort of um, way of describing it is, is as if our flesh suddenly turned clear and you can see the skeleton. And that's why it's called bleaching. It's, it's the, the animal turning white. Now, and now this is obviously uh, due to uh, or a consequence of uh, global warming, the oceans heating up. How does coral, outside of being an absolutely just beautiful creature at the bottom of the ocean, how does it fit into sort of our webbed, connected ecosystem? Well, um, a lot of people think that coral reefs are really yeah, great when you're on holiday to go and have a look because they look pretty. But people don't realise just how important they are. I mean, they are the nurseries of the ocean. Uh, something like a quarter of all ocean life depends on coral reefs. Um, and they also support about a billion people for food and income. So it's just one of the most important ecosystems on the planet. 
I think that at one point in the film, someone says that at the rate that it's sort of uh, that they're disappearing, that they're dying. It's like uh, imagine sort of all of the trees from like up the East Coast just completely yeah. gone, right? Um, what we documented last year was part of this bleaching event that happened in Australia last year, and Australia was hit so badly that it was the northern third that pretty much experienced a lot of death. Um, it's basically uh, Washington D.C. to Maine, that equivalent off the off the eastern seaboard. Picture all the trees in that area turning white and then and then dying. That's what was happening in the water. Now, when you started making the film, when 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 Richard got in touch with you, did you know that you were gonna this was gonna be happening in Australia? Or because it felt to me when I was watching the film that suddenly as filmmakers things shifted. For yeah, you guys. Um, we had to. It's called chasing coral for a reason. Like we had to chase the story, and we were really chasing these underwater heat waves. And so we were working with Richard and a team of scientists to predict where this phenomenon was going to happen, so that we can get there in time, get there in advance of of the actual bleaching event to be able to capture it. There's a, a moment in the film where you guys are diving and you're seeing these 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 this coral get bleached, and you come up and you have to sort of cross a party boat. And it's so sad because it is this uh, amazing symbol or represent, representation of the system itself and how it doesn't stop even though we can see the, the sort of outcomes of, of what happened, the consequences of, of, our, of our system. What was that like for you guys? Can you talk about that moment? I mean, that was a, a really surreal moment. Um, you know, you jump in the water there and I've never seen a sight that's quite so stunningly beautiful um, in all my life. I mean, these... These animals were glowing. Um, it's like highlighter yellow and, and bright blues and bright oranges. But at the same time, you could hear the party above. So you've just got the beat underwater. And we were underwater for about six hours that day. And then you come up into this, this party scene and everyone's it, it's, it's just totally oblivious to one of the, the greatest transformations, one of the most spectacular uh, transformations in nature, but one of the most tragic. Um, and it's just not being noticed. So people can, can, can continue to live their lives and live their lives sort of in a, a kind of oblivion. Well, it's, the, yes, it's, it's the, one of the biggest problems with the ocean is it's very difficult to document. And people just, it's something like one, uh, less than 1% of people have ever been diving in history. And so um, we need to be able to communicate it in a different way, which is why when I saw Chasing Ice and I saw the power of the emotion of that film, I realized that that's really what we needed to do, was really focus on a film to tell this story so people could get engaged. And that's actually been a, a, a big cause for you, right, Zach, is, is sort of going around the world and, and, and showing at the children what, what it looks like under the ocean, getting them excited, not just about coral, but about diving. And, and Right. Virtual reality has given us this amazing opportunity to share these worlds in an immersive way that really hasn't been possible previously. Um, it's like for me, I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, and, and we get to, I get to work with local kids there pretty frequently. And talking about a landlocked state in which these kids may not have that opportunity to go diving. Um, but you can go into a classroom and give them an experience and allow them to fall in love with what that world's like um, to really see how, how thriving this world beneath the surface really can be. And, and that cultivates their curiosity. And it's not about um, whether or not they're going to grow up and become the next coral scientist. It's about growing up understanding science and being curious in science and in cultivating the next generation of children that are going to become, um, you know, the leaders of, of the world in technology and the science that's going to push us forward in a progressive way. Jeff, talk about um, taking coral not just uh, as something beautiful at the bottom of the ocean, but also kind of per creating a, a life in the film so that we do feel emotionally connected yeah. to it. There, I mean, there were moments in the film that you know, people in the film are crying when, when they're watching your presentation, but I, I was crying at moments, and yeah. it has a lot to do with the way you use music, the way you use these animations, but sort of coming up with all those ideas, knowing that you really needed to sort of take coral and make it a sort of living, breathing, uh, emotional life. Yeah, I mean, just as Zach was explaining coral a few minutes ago, I knew nothing about corals getting into this project. I knew very little about the ocean. So for me, um, being sensitive to how most audience members are probably like, we, most people don't know what corals are, what they do, how they function. So one of the challenges there um, is to get the audience to fall in love with corals, but that's part of the magic too. Like you can photograph corals in, in particular ways that make them, you can see up close how they function, how they move. They are 
beautiful creatures, super colorful. You can see those little plants living in their flesh that Zach was talking about. They're alien -like. They it's look so like cool. aliens. It is out of this world. And so um, one of the really fun things to do for this film also was kind of psychedelic, sorry. It is like, psychedelic. Oh. It is, oh, it is psychedelic. The that I was watching, I was like, I wish I was the in colors, <laughs> yeah, The colors are out of this world. And I think that's one of the most amazing things when you start looking at these and studying them and, and looking at them up close they are magical alien creatures. And so what we were trying to do was convey that, that sense of awe and wonder of this, of this ecosystem. Share that with the audience so that you can fall in love with this place and, and see why these scientists love this ecosystem so much. How did you go about using uh, sort of filmmaking techniques to yeah. make sure that they came off as magical yeah. creatures? Because they do come off like creatures. Well, that's the thing. They are living animals, yes. and we have to show that. And when you look at it, sometimes a coral just looks like a rock. It looks static. And so for the average person, it's just sitting there. But close up on each one of those little bumps are many, many, many tiny little mouths. You can see the tentacles moving. You can see them feeding and see them eating. And you recognize, oh, this actually is a living creature. What so we used, we used a lot of macro photography. Yeah, so what was that like for you when you first saw that macro photography? Was that like a, a revelation for you sort of in, the, in terms of storytelling? You're like, oh, this is the yeah. moment. This oh, is what I can it, We use. knew it was a, a hook immediately. We knew that we needed to use this footage. We knew we were going to do some big scenes around this type of footage. And the color, they, it is, I don't know how to say it, like, just watch the film and you'll see what we're talking about. It <laughs> is crazy. Yeah. What was it like for you? Did you find it difficult to sort of get audiences engaged? And in, 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 that, was that part of the challenge for you to make sure that they cared about coral at the end of this? Because there is one of the issues with extinction in regards to animals and with ice is that, you know, I think even some climate change believers feel like uh, there's nothing that they can do. And it's like, well, the world will adapt and those things will go away, which is not necessarily how we should view the situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, we definitely wanted audiences to understand why these ecosystems are so important. But to your point, like, to some degree, this film is not even about coral. This yeah. film is about this much bigger change that's happening on the planet right now. And we're not doing this, I don't know, I'm, I'm, from my perspective, it's not a matter of saving the planet. Like, that's absurd. Like, the planet will be fine. Coral reefs, however, are likely going to disappear. And other ecosystems are likely going to disappear. And the changes happening on the planet are really going to affect humans. It's, we're, humans are what's going to suffer. And how well we can endure those changes, that's really what's in jeopardy. So you can look at Syria, for example. Yeah. It's linked to a drought. It's linked to climate change. And the those, greatest drought there in hundreds of years, right? It's massive. And we're only going to see more and more climate refugees like that coming over the, the coming decades. Like that, that has a huge, huge political consequence, and we need to be prepared for that. And yet, for some reason, people are unwilling. And I don't want to say people because not all people, but there are lots of people who are really unwilling to address and confront these sort of inextricable links between climate change and, and geopolitical well, it's, forces. It's very complicated. There's a lot of different stories that do get interconnected around this, this bigger issue of how the planet's changing, how we're, we're changing the chemistry of the planet, both in the atmosphere and in the ocean. So we're seeing these changes happening, and it's hard for the average person to see where all the dots connect. Now I have to ask, when did you finish the film? Uh, we launched the film at Sundance this year, so we finished it probably the day before Sundance. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so you yeah. finished it after after the election, oh, we did. whereas yeah. you know the new ad the administration going out was one that had, was much more receptive to climate change yeah. ideas and doing uh, what they could to combat it. While the new administration coming in right. has uh, pulled out of the Paris Accord, uh, which is you know a largely symbolic thing. But what? Uh, what does that feel like to be working on something like this, to have this be your passion project and just feel like what was going one way is now you know, being completely reversed? Um, it's not being reversed, and that's the thing. So President Trump might have stepped out of Paris, but this movement that we've seen from the rest of the country has massively counteracted that. We've, we've seen more progress on climate change in the last few months than probably in the last few decades, I would argue. Um, we're seeing hundreds of cities all pledging to, to switch to clean energy. And that movement, that, that catalyzing force is happening. And I, I do feel like we're getting to a tipping point close where the momentum and the energy around this unstoppable movement will sort of flip. And there was an announcement today by Michael Bloomberg about America's pledge. So I think it's 227 cities. Um, I think 1,700 companies have all got together, and I think nine states, 
to, to meet the obligations of the Paris Agreement. So it doesn't need yeah. to necessarily happen at a federal level. Zach, what, what about you? I mean, you've been, you've been working so hard on this uh, subject as well. Yeah, I, w w oddly enough, um, I think that this administration and, and the pulling out of Paris as a whole is actually the, the single most optimistic thing that I have going for me right now internally, because like Jeff said, this is the single largest, um, you know, mobilization of activism that I think that this country's seen in a really long time. Um, and I think had it gone the other way, we'd still be stuck in this stagnation. And in the field that we work in, there's a newfound sense of urgency and a newfound sense of enthusiasm to do what we do and to fight the fight that um, is happening. And, and that's really unique. And I think that we needed something like this. Yeah, I think the, the takeaway there is that the federal government isn't going to solve this for us and that the local levels are the ones that have to now step up. And that's where you can make the most change anyway. That's where you can make the biggest impact. It's at the local level. It's with your community. Um, if your city has not pledged to be 100% carbon free, you have a huge amount of work you can do in your own community to activate your, your networks, your friends, your peers, the local politicians to, to shift over in a way that we know is sustainable. Now, I don't think I saw the list of cities at the end of the film. I don't think I remember seeing New York City on that list. Was it? Um, is New York City one I of the don't pledged? Know. We should find that out. Um, I don't think it's, it's on the list in the film, but that might have been updated since we finished making oh. the film. Um, I hope so. So I hope so. We'll go find out. We'll go talk to, uh, to Bloomberg. Uh, before I turn it over to audience questions, you know you've chased ice, chasing coral, or is there a third chaser film um, that we can look use a, a nap for like an extended period of time? Want to take a little bit of a break? Um, That's right. We should say you are you are officially done. The film has been launched on Netflix. It is, it is on, on Netflix, Netflix right now. Today. I get a, a slight little like ten minute break. Then we have to just keep doing some more uh, outreach because we're really focusing on getting this film in front of uh, audiences. And Netflix is a perfect platform for it. It's available globally. But then we want to go out there and have conversations with audiences so they can figure out what can they do in their local community. How can we help facilitate um, all community groups across the country to get involved and to take action? Well, so we should. Have, what, what can people do? Well, the first thing is is knowing the story, knowing what's happening, and that's the biggest thing. We're really trying to push what we saw, what we captured, um, so that people can understand climate change is not some distant, far off threat. It's not something about you know carbon in the atmosphere. It, there are these direct consequences that you can see, and we hope that people can watch the film and understand how much of a priority this needs to be. So the biggest thing we're really encouraging is for people to host sc screenings of the film. And you can do that all through Netflix. You can go to chasingcoral.com, and you can sign up to host a screening to work with our team. Our team is sending out materials, um, screening guides, um, and, and other materials that can help, uh, help anybody set up a screening in their own home. In their own home. Now the film, it, it, as, as you talk about it right now, it's obvious that the film in many ways is, a, is an activist film and it's, and it's meant to be educational, but it is also highly uh, aesthetically pleasing. Is that something that, you've, that, that is difficult for you to find as a filmmaker to make sure yeah. to weave those two things together? I actually, I, I try not to personally think of it as an activist film. We were trying to just tell a story and we, this is entertainment and it's storytelling and it's filmmaking and it happens to be about a subject that has a bit of information and science in it and it has a bit of a, a wake up call for what's happening on the planet. But it is like we're trying to use all the regular tools of filmmaking and, and cinematography and aerial cameras and drones and uh, slow motion and time lapses and all of these techniques that really make it, in, in my mind, hopefully, uh, it's a film first and foremost that you can just watch for the, own, for the entertainment value of it. And in that process, you'll learn a bit about what's going on in the oceans. Awesome. Let's get some questions from the audience. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, you said that you worked with scientists for um, figuring out where a big bleaching event would happen. How often do those events actually happen? Well, there's really been sort of two global bleaching events, um, one in 1998 and then uh, one in 2010, and this is the third one. When we started following, um, uh, well, when the, the event started, we thought it would follow the pattern of the previous two, which was uh, it lasted about a year. But this one carried on for pretty much three years. Um, it's been by far the, the biggest bleaching event in, in history. Um, but we needed that science to be able to predict where to go. And it was so important for us to work with people like um, yeah, Mark Aiken that uh, is in the, the film at NOAA, who is able to predict where we, could, we should set up these cameras. We literally were working with Mark and others to uh, look at the satellite data and we can tell 
this part of the planet is abnormally hot. And if it stays like that, we were tracking it, and if it stayed like that for a few weeks, we would know that that area would start to have corals turning white. And we were sort of on the ground confirming, visually confirming what the satellites were telling us, and we, we knew this place was likely going to turn white, and sure enough, that's, that's what happened. And really, we found ourselves in this you know, unique situation of having the right technology for the first time to be able to reveal an event like this properly um, on a global scale. So it was really a, just an opportunity we, we, we didn't want to miss. Next question. Hi, thanks for being here. I like your coral shirt. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering, what was it like um, shooting underwater, and was that difficult to kind of plan your shots? Um, it, there's a learning curve. For me, I hadn't done much underwater cinematography um, and met Richard and met all these photographers and started to learn how to use these uh, very special housings to keep your camera dry underwater and how you can still operate all the buttons and, and f use the camera while you're shooting underwater. Um, I, when we look back at our footage, the very first couple months of footage looks pretty mediocre, to be honest, and you can tell, like, you can see the evolution in our learning how to shoot over the course of the production. But it's incredibly fun. So you, like when you're shooting, uh, if, if, if you're a filmmaker, you can use dollies, you can use drones, you can use cranes. You, there are these tools for moving the camera through space. But when you're underwater, you can do that all by yourself. You can inhale and go up, you can exhale and go down, you can kick and swim wherever you want really smoothly, and you can just hold this camera and you can do awesome spinning dolly shots like by yourself. It's, it's actually really, really fun. And from the tech side too, like we did some pretty interesting things with the cameras, like particularly with the time lapse, because you're trying to obviously take the same image over and over again, over days and days and days. Um, and so we had laser beams um, with markers so that we could put ourselves back in three dimensional space and laminated sheets of the first day's shots. Um, and just all of these weird things that we decided to like, hey, let's try this. No one's ever done this before. Um, let's see what it takes from a technology standpoint to do this effectively. Um, so it's like this huge experimenting process, which is actually really fun as well, being underwater and um, doing something that really no one had done before. And uh, I was a little bit shocked the first time I met um, Jeff, you know, when we met him in person and we started talking about the potential of doing a film. And I asked him who his cameraman was going to be underwater. And he said, uh, me. I said, um, do you dive? And not really. Um, I've done about five dives. <laughs> um, so most <laughs> cameramen would only ever attempt this after about 20 years of experience. But um, Jeff, to his credit, learned on the job. Were you nervous about that? Uh, not really. I mean, <laughs> no. It, it was just like you just get to... That's the cool thing about this job. Like, for me, we get to learn these things. We get to go out in the field and go on these adventures. And, like, part of the goal... Like, actually, we just did this film just so I could learn how to scuba dive. I didn't tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And most uh, underwater films are filmed in the same way. Jeff came in with completely fresh eyes. And, and it was just a, um, a joy to watch. I think we have time for one more question. Hi. So there's a lot of moving parts in this film. You have the scientific data, the diving, the main characters, and a bunch of other things. How do you manage and prioritize that for production? Uh, great question. Um, uh, long answer, but I'll keep it super, super tight. Um, really, it's always the story comes first. And what's the story and, and figuring out the story. And at the start of the project, we didn't know what the story was going to be. So when Richard and I first met, there are a lot of things affecting the oceans. You've got plastic in the ocean, uh, which is a huge, huge problem. You've got overfishing. You've got ocean acidification. You've got agricultural runoff. I could keep going for a long time about all those problems. And we were we kept talking and seeing what's the most important story. What can we visualize? How What can work well in a film. Um, that's not just information that's being transferred, but something that you can actually see. And that's when we came across the bleaching story and kept focusing on that. And that's really when, when we realized what that the core focus was going to be, it really helps solidify what doesn't belong in the film. So it's really, a lot of it is just elimination of the stuff that doesn't fit, and then constantly trying to shoot and explore and, and see what's there. But um, there are so many moving parts and moving storylines. Um, it, it really is, once, once you get that notion of what the 
essence of the project is about, that, that makes it easy to, to make decisions. This is tangential, uh, but the, the plastic in the ocean thing, isn't it true that like yeah. the, the, there's so much plastic in the ocean that fish are consuming plastic and it's like getting into, yeah. we're basically eating we're fish eating that have plastic. We're eating plastic now yeah. through the fish. So plastic is floating around in the ocean. It's breaking down into tiny little parts and smaller fish eat it and then bigger fish eat it. And this plastic is entering into human food supply. On top of it, a lot of these plastics are actually endocrine disruptors. So they mess with your hormones. So with kids kids, like small kids eating fish or eating like in some cases, uh, basically the equivalent of estrogen coming through these chemicals that have been transferred through this food supply. So this is a huge, huge issue. Um, the projections are looking like by 2050, I believe, there's going to be more plastic mass in the ocean than fish. That, that is crazy. So there are people working. How do we clean the plastic up? Like, nobody should ever be using plastic for any disposal. Like, there's no reason to use a disposable plastic straw or a disposable plastic water bottle. Like, this is a huge, huge problem, and the oceans have become sort of a, a landfill for a lot of just human waste. Guys, uh, congratulations on the film. It's really beautiful and, and, and tragic. Thank you. <laughs> but it, it is an incredible piece of work. Uh, and it's on Netflix today, right? It's on Netflix. It, it launched at midnight Pacific time. Uh, our team stayed up until 3 o'clock in the morning to like watch the first thing. And we, we hit play, and we tested it. It works. Uh, so we know it's playing. So we're all good there. Such an independent filmmaker, you didn't trust Netflix to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Just need to make sure it's playing. Guys, congratulations. Give him a hand. Chasing Carl, everybody. Thank, Thank you guys you. so much. Awesome.